Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring issues of importance right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. As the General Assembly finishes its work this spring, we thought it was important to bring to you a view of some of the election-related legislation that's working its way through the Assembly. And who better to have uh, in our, on our program to talk about it than our Secretary of State? Nellie Gorbea, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate the opportunity. We've done a lot over the last three years mm -hmm. to improve uh, access to the ballot box and protect the integrity of every vote. Uh, but I still have a couple more things that I want to get done. Before, just a couple. Just, just a couple. So you've got a couple so of legislative initiatives I, that you've put in this year. I do. I've introduced legislation uh, in support of early in-person voting, something that I know uh, your membership and, and many of the people watching this uh, will want to support. Uh, basically, what early in-person voting does, my bill, is it takes a process that already exists right now, 20 days before an election, you can uh, go and get an emergency mail ballot. We call it emergency mail ballot or emergency ballots. It involves a lot of paperwork because you have to apply for the ballot. Then once you get that notarized or two, wit two signatures witness, you have, then you get the ballot, you vote on it, then you come back, they give you an envelope that you put it in that you have to fill out again. And then those envelopes are all stored during those 20 days and taken up every day to the Board of Elections where they store them to then verify that the voter is who they say they are and all that according to the records. And then if everything checks out, they open the envelope and then they put the ballot on a pile that then gets passed through the machine. If for some reason there's a problem with that ballot, you lose your vote because they don't know whose ballot it is and you can't get a hold of the voter. So what I'm proposing to do is to get rid of all that paper shuffling during those same 20 days, just have a polling location where you would walk in, you either show your ID or if for some reason you don't have it, you can do a provisional ballot. But you know, assuming that you have your ID, you then um, are checked in uh, with our new electronic poll books, uh, and then vote, and then you get to put your ballot into the machine. So if there is a problem with your ballot, it'll spit it right back at you, and you have time to actually figure out what's wrong with it so that it goes through. How many location or locations uh, are you proposing having for this in-person voting? So this would all be uh, at uh, one in every community, um, and, and each community would then decide with the Board of Elections where some city halls aren't able to accommodate because they're older buildings, uh, this kind of setup. But certainly they have a senior center nearby that they could be, you know, that could be used, um, and so that where and, and how many machines and all that would be uh, the purview of that local board of canvassers with the state board of elections. But there would be one, op one location one in location. every city or town. That's right, for those 20 days during office hours. Now, the other thing that my bill does, which I think is of great interest to pretty much every Rhode Islander that I speak with who works, which is we would also allow early voting on the Saturday and Sunday before the mm. election or the primary. and so. That's critical because I know as a working mom that some days I just can't get out of work in time to go to some office. You know, I, I, I'm from North Kingstown and I work in Providence. And with all of the different things that you have and the kids and everything, you just don't have time. So this would allow for four hours on a Saturday, four hours on a Sunday, right before the election to vote. I know on occasion I follow elections in other countries and, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised how many of them vote on weekends. They don't yeah. vote during the week. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea there being that, you know, just people have a little bit more free time. In this particular country, because we have, you know, basically a separation of church and state, you want to make sure that you make it accessible both on the Saturday and the Sunday so that if there are any kind of uh, religious uh, mm -hmm. preferences that you can accommodate everybody. So the, this bill is House Bill 7501 that was uh, introduced at my request uh, by Representative Solomon. 
And then on the Senate side, it's Senate 2419, and it was introduced by Senator uh, Aaron Lynch Prado. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to get it passed this time around. It won't take effect for the 2018 elections, it would take effect for the 2020. Because any kind of change like this, you really need to have some time to figure out how exactly it's gonna yeah. work. I don't know if there was any opposition, but what questions or issues have arisen and how do you respond to them? Yeah, so so one of them has to do with whether or not this would allow um, sort of a greater investment from outside forces into elections um, in terms of trying to get the vote out, but, but it's already happening. I mean, we've seen a 180% increase in the use of emergency mm -hmm. ballots since 2012. So we went from 5,400 ballots, 5,600 ballots, to over 15,000. So people are taking advantage of the system. It's just it's a clunky system. So I'm proposing to clean it up. I mean, the other one would be that there's some added uh, costs uh, from the Saturday and Sunday to the municipalities or, or where they would be located. Uh, and you know, to that I say, you know, talk to your voters. They want this. Um, and government needs to be responsive to people. There are other ways in which I think we can save money. For example, as we change things with these electronic poll books, you don't have to print them, you don't have to, there's a number of things that we can do to show that there are savings in other parts of the election process. But this one that really helps people vote, we should not be arguing dollars and cents on. People shop on their couches at all hours of the day and night. Our economy is so geared towards convenience, it's just surprising that uh, we seem behind the times when it comes to voting. I know, well, <laughs> hopefully we'll get, we'll, we'll move it uh, in this session. Mm -hmm. uh, my other uh, bill that uh, uh, is, has to do with elections is basically moving the primary day. And this came out of the fact that I am one of a three generation you know, military family. Uh, my, my grandfather, my father, and my brother have all served uh, in the U.S. Army, and my brother actually served in Iraq, and I know firsthand how difficult it is for somebody like that to cast that important right to vote, to cast that ballot. So um, our uh, uh, primary is so late. We're only one of you know a handful of states, like four states, that still have a September primary. Uh, that that leaves us with very little time. If, if you think about a primary being held, if there's any kind of contested race, uh, the, the kind of uh, things that need to happen before a, a ballot is certified for the general, uh, I am very concerned about us not being able to meet the federal uh, law, which requires us to get ballots out 45 days before an election. So that's a, that's a federal mandate. Because our, our primary is in the second week in September that's right. already. So, so my proposal is to move it into the end of August, uh, third week of August. Uh, I think that that would give us enough time, particularly as the state moves forward with risk-limiting audits, which is a new requirement that was just passed last session that further verifies that the voting machines and the tallies were all accurate. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be another step done after an election. I just wanna make sure that we are not shortchanging the ability to vote of our you know, men and women in uniform are overseas citizens, uh, many of whom are really you know, doing their most to serve our country, to give us that freedom to be able to vote. And this bill I've heard a little bit of talk about because there's some folks who have raised some concern about uh, voting in the summer as opposed to voting in September. Yeah. How do you respond to that? I think, you know, like you were saying earlier, the world has changed. You know, people for the most part are, st are starting to come back and are around. We do have three ways of voting, mail ballots, emergency or early voting, mm -hmm. and then um, we also have election day. So, you know, we've been scouring research to see if we can find any evidence, because there are a lot of other states actually that hold their primaries much earlier than we do. And we can't find any evidence of showing a drop off due to somehow the summer. We would be joining 12 other states, including Connecticut and Vermont that also hold their uh, primaries in August. So, I, you know, people raise concerns. I'm trying to find evidence of the contrary and uh, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing it, so. Yeah. And there are plenty of states that have them in the spring, let alone yes, uh, over yes. the summer. You didn't propose going that early. No, yeah. no, I think that would be very hard given the fact that we're really in the middle of the legislative session. And 
uh, too many, the, the attention is just somewhere else. Um, but, but in the last few minutes, I want to say that uh, one of the things that we are uh, putting out by the time your, your viewers see this is a brand new voter information page on our website. And if you go to vote.ri.gov, you will find one-stop shopping on your laptop, on your uh, electronic pad, or on uh, your mobile, where you can find not just where you need to vote, you can update your voting address, you can actually register to vote online, uh, but you can also find out who are your electeds all the way down to your municipals. Uh, a lot of information about voting, data, you know, numbers of registered voters, uh, just a really wonderful one-stop place for elections in Rhode Island. And so if you're, you find somebody who's new to the state, my goal is that you can send them to this page at vote.ri.gov and they can learn anything they need to know about the structure of elections yeah. in the state. Because I think one of the reasons people sometimes don't vote is because they don't really know. They don't know what's on the ballot. They don't know who are their electeds. This is one way that you're going to be able to figure this out. Yeah. Um, just uh, ironically and personally, I was talking to my mother who lives in New York uh, just yesterday, and she had a special election, went to a regular polling place, and lo and behold, the lines had changed and the yeah. polling location had changed. So it's so important for people to be able to have a place where they can go get basic information about voting. Yeah, no, and so we've made it a lot easier. And I think, you know, people will like it. The best thing about it is, is that this was done by state workers uh, with state dollars. And so if anybody has any improvements on it, just send them my way and mm -hmm. we'll tackle them. Sure. Uh, one thing I skipped mm -hmm. over when we were talking about the uh, change of the um, uh, primary election mm -hmm. day is uh, the bills and the bill sponsors. So I just- Oh, sorry, uh, yes. Okay. I want to make sure that people know about this. Yes, mm -hmm. in the House, uh, Representative Art Handy and Majority Lead Leader uh, Joe Shikarchi have introduced 7721. Uh, and on the, on the Senate side, Senator Frank Lombardi has uh, been kind enough to introduce it as Senate Bill 2446. And so I'm deeply appreciative of my <laughs> House and Senate sponsors uh, for introducing this uh, bill to move the primary yeah. day. And have you had hearings on uh, those bills? We have yeah. had some hearings um, on the House side. On the Senate side, it's actually this Thursday. Oh. We'll be, we'll be tes I'll be testifying. You'll, you'll be showing up in person for this one. <laughs> That's terrific. Um, are any final comments on, on voting itself? I know we have a yeah. different uh, primary election uh, day this yes. year. If you want to let our this, viewers know about that. Thank you for, for reminding me. Yes, absolutely. This year, voting for the primary is not on a Tuesday. It's on a Wednesday because of uh, the religious observances in the Jewish uh, religious calendar that affects some communities. We were asked to move the date. So it's September 12th, but it's on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll be doing a lot of uh, public information on that. But uh, the best thing to do is to go to vote.ri.gov. You get all of the information about when is your upcoming primary, where you're going to be voting there, and then for the general as well. And you can look at your ballot. You can just, you know, with a lot of time, you can just figure it all out. Yeah. And uh, final comment before we close. It's always important for our, <laughs> our members to be aware of um, registering to vote. What's your advice on people um, who aren't registered who want to get registered? Where so, should they go? So they can actually go to vote.ri.gov and register to vote online. Uh, if you are, do not have a driver's license or a state ID, the system will prompt you to print that form out that you filled out and sign it and mail it back. But if you've already got a, a voter, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a driver's license or a state ID, you can just register right there at vote.ri.gov. Um, we will be also implementing automatic voter registration in about a month. And so from now on, when you go to DMV and you up, update your address, we'll know about it automatically, which will be a great relief for many people. That sure will be. Any final comments for our viewers, no, Secretary just, of State? Uh, thank you. Uh, no, just uh, really excited about uh, conveying to the voters all the improvements that we've made and uh, looking forward to seeing people around as we uh, talk to people around in the state. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. My name is Jim Riley. I'll be your host this evening.
My guest tonight is Senator John J. Tassoni, Jr. John is the editor of Common Ground Magazine, as well as the host of Common Ground Radio and Recovery Radio, which airs on Mondays between 3 to 5 on AM 790 WPRV. John is currently the Director of Operations of the Substance Use Mental Health Leadership Council. John, it's terrific to have you here today. Thank you for today having me. Today we're going to talk about my favorite monthly magazine in Rhode Island, Common Ground. And this is a, a magazine that I know a lot of my friends in the labor movement, we talk about it, we wait for it to come out every month. And I think the reason a lot of people like it is because all the activities that, our, that my local unit I used to work with, uh, Local 328 and the Rhode Island Institute for Labor Studies and Research where I am currently employed, and all the other uh, labor leaders talk about you know, how, how great it is not only to have their, their regular activities for that month to be in a magazine, but to share those, uh, those memories with the individuals and their membership who were, for instance, if it was a picket line, they get the, I get the members uh, all, all a copy of, of the activity. If, if somebody's helping us with a particularly feel-good event, we make sure that they get a copy of at all. And it's, it's a terrific, terrific job, and thank you very much, and it's good to have you. And thank you. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, when, did you, when did the paper start? Where did this idea come from? The idea came about uh, in 2009. We put it in production in January 2010. Uh, the idea came from myself sitting on the executive board of the AFL-CIO, and always the conversation was what the local competitor always put in the paper, everything negative about the unions. And I got sick and tired of it. And when I uh, decided to run that paper and, and put it together, um, I told the AFL-CIO it was going to be all good stuff that we do so the public knows we're not the big bad union officials and unions that we are in the state. We needed to put all the good information out that we do uh, as far as food banks, as far as clothing collections, as far as Christmas gifts, uh, turkey gifts, the whole bit. You know, I know that you, you've uh, covered uh, Local 328 when we have our golf tournament, and we've raised over a million dollars, uh, and we could never get the mainstream media to come in and do a story on that. And uh, it's great that you came down and we got some, some ink out of that, and you've done a lot, of, a lot of stuff over there. So what kind of stories do you concentrate on? I, tr I try to cover contract negotiations. I try to cover all good stories that the labor union uh, does for the normal person as far as doing handicap ramps, as far as building ball fields, as far as doing anything that was into the point of donations uh, throughout the state of Rhode Island. Those are the type of stories and individual stories um, of uh, workers and their accomplishments. Um, I know um, I've done a lot on the labor's end. Uh, they have a, a particular young lady there that's a weightlifter, and we've covered a number of stories uh, pertaining to her as Mrs. Rhode Island. Um, and it, it's, all, it's all good stuff that people, the, the competition would never put in the paper and, and give us any credit. You know, I'm all about trying to help out the union movement, trying to get people to understand there's two sides to every table, the table's not flipped upside down, and there is a, a company and there's a union on both sides, and you know, the goodness of this stuff that comes out needs to come out because we always get a bad rap. For instance, uh, the front page of this one is the Eastland workers uh, staged a, a one-day strike. I notice you have a lot of that uh, in, in the magazine on a regular basis. You know, all the, all the kind of stuff, whether it's everyday operations, whether it's negotiations, whether it's organizing, that's what I like about the paper. Hmm. I mean, I, I can get, I get the paper every month and check it out, and uh, I can see the activities of all the local organizations that uh, that have activities but, going But on. it's not, Jimmy, it's not just me. Yeah. Um, obviously, Tom Hoffman, who, who puts the paper together, uh, Karen Enzavino, who is the, my graphic artist. This is a team effort. It, we're a three-teamer. Um, you know, I'm at the helm, obviously, but Tom mostly does the grunt of all the work with the stories, and, and Karen puts it together. We, we make a great team, and there's not a lot of hiccups with Common Ground. It, Common Ground normally runs by itself. With the, with the three of us. I mean, there's not a lot of interference. The three of us always share information. I get information from being a former union official. 
I send it to Tom, he goes to the event, Karen sometimes goes with him, shoots the, uh, the videos or the, uh, the photos, and it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. I have to give them a lot of credit. So you got a great staff, they do a good work for you. I know Tommy Hoffman did a great uh, job on the uh, Frank Montanero article. And it was also nice to have you, uh, uh, Ed McElroy, remembering right. too, so yeah. you bring the guests in to do no, there's that. A lot of, there's a lot of history here in Rhode Island, yes. a lot of history. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I'm able to do what I do. And um, again, you know, last month was our 100th anniversary, which I'm very proud of. Um, you know, no one, no one gave me a chance when I first started. They said, you're crazy. You know, I dumped a lot of my own money in yeah. to start it because I got sick and tired of reading in, uh, you know, my competition's paper. Um, but, you know, it's working out. Obviously, sure. 100 edition, which is uh, almost nine years. Well, let's, take about, let's talk about um, your advertisers. I know that at Local 328, we signed a board right away, and we have been a consistent sponsor now for all uh, every issue that you've had. And how do you go about getting the advertising and maintaining and changing and different things and, you know, that sort of thing? Well, that, that's, that's done. Um, I, I'm the only salesperson that we uh -huh. have. I have two other ladies back at the office that sell for my other magazine, but basically when i get a call like i just got a call from the musicians union we put a big ad in for them uh this month they're having an event uh it's all by word of mouth and i have a 99.9 percent .9 retention rating uh for all my ads all the unions have been fabulous uh mm -hmm. sticking with me um advertising every month and it's a commitment it's yeah. a commitment it's a commitment by everybody yeah where do you where do you print the uh it, actually right now it's it's printed in springfield massachusetts oh okay yeah. i probably know the folks over there you i spent probably a lot of time do. in springfield so john how many uh issues do you print every month we print twelve thousand a month we have an online version uh that is what they call a flip which you can actually go online tab on the arrow and it actually flips the pages so you can read it. Oh really? It's called that's a Uber flip. That's interesting. Not an Uber ride, it's no. a Uber flip. Uber flip. Okay, John, you've got lots of stories in every article. Some are, most of them are labor oriented. Right. Some of them are not. So how do you go about getting the stories? How do you go about filling in all the spaces in this great monthly magazine? That's a great question. It's, 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 Tactically um, maneuvered, I'll use that word. Um, I, I do get calls from unions um, about different events that they may have, uh, about an employee, a union member who may have, uh, who's done something extraordinary. Uh, most of the time, uh, we get the feed from the AFL-CIO. If there's going to be a picket line, I get notification because I sit on the board. I then in turn email Tom and after school, most of the time, because Tom works for the Providence Schools, uh, he may go to that event, take pictures, or if he can't make it, I'll call the union itself, say, listen, can you take some photos and send them back to me? Uh, I'll have Tom follow up with a story and we'll write a, an article about it. Mm -hmm. And you'll actually come to uh, to the local unions themselves and come inside and do a, do uh, an article right there. Yeah, one one of the things that uh, I'm very proud of is as I hand deliver uh, that newspaper every month, like I did at 6:30 this morning, to every union hall in the state, so I can see the president, and the business agent, and ask them of any updates or things they might might want in next month's issue. Uh, I've been doing that for nine years now. Okay, Johnny, I mean, you've, you've uh, finished your 100th issue. Tell us about some of the stories over the years that have had the most, most impacting uh, element uh, that you can remember. Well, one of the ones that really sticks out in my mind, because I was uh, a business agent at the time that it happened, was the station nightclub fire. And the amount of work and financial support that the unions gave that memorial uh, was touching. Um, the work that they did there, it's a beautiful memorial. Um, you know, and I, I think of that often because when I represented uh, the workers in West Warwick, those individuals had to transport a lot of the people who had perished in that, in that fire uh, in uh, town vehicles because there wasn't enough rescues to do that. And a lot of guys and girls had to go for treatment uh, after that, because it's stuck in their their head, and and I can remember, and I was a business agent also at 
at the at the morgue, and when when that happened, it, it was a truly a, a devastating uh, event that I, I I will never forget. Yeah, that you know, a lot of people don't realize is that uh, we have 39 towns in this state, and when something that like that happens, it affects everybody in the state. Mm. We lost four members of USCW Local 328 mm. in that tragic fire. Yeah. Mm. Anything else that you can remember, uh, a particular impacting kind of story? Well, that, uh, one of the other ones that really I got a lot of feedback from was the memorial to Frank. Oh, that was a great, and this the pitches, is a great article. The yeah. pictures that we had, uh, yeah. the Montanaro family contacted me. Um, I got them a lot of extra copies. Uh, and Frank Jr., uh, who works at the State House, I. I I uh, had a long conversation with him and, and the family, and Frank's son was in uh, a few of the pitches as a, as a bearer. Mm -hmm. um, that was, uh, I, I think that, that probably ranks number one, really, to be honest with you, ranks number one. Because when I first started, Frank coached me. Yeah. You know, he took me under his wing, told me what to do, what not to do. Yeah. You know, so he was like a, he was like a father figure. Yeah. You know, son, don't do that. Son, don't do that. Yeah. Son, do that. Keep yeah. going like that. Anything I can do for you. And he was like that. Yeah. You know? I distinctly remember uh, the first time that I met him well, as well. So, uh, John, congratulations on your 100th issue. And we're looking forward to, to 200th. I'll be here. Thank you for watching this edition of Labor Vision. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.